So the question of getting the uh, voters re-register, I think it's going to be one of the key ones. Uh, but again, why can't we do what other democratic nations do and simply command the election officials to register people to vote? Right. And, and again, right? right? Exactly. Yeah. All right, uh, with that in mind, uh, we're uh, privileged to have Norman Solomon uh, here. Journalist, media critic, author, activist, the man behind uh, the notion of fair and accurate media in America. And for years, I had the privilege of running them in the uh, Columbus uh, Free Press. Uh, and again, he, he's done it all. I consider him uh, one of, if not if, the foremost media critic of the mainstream corporate media in America, Norman Solomon. made it possible, you know, it's only because people do the groundwork that things can ever happen. Uh, I think of something that uh, Upton Sinclair said when he ran for governor in the state in 1934, subjected to the first attack ad through newsreels, uh, movies, in the movie theaters. He said, enough words, we need deeds. And as a writer, I like words. I like deeds even better. Because we got to organize, and as I look around this room, I see people who I've seen at meetings and demonstrations six, eight, ten, twenty years ago. And that's what it means about being a long distance runner, about keeping on, about continuing what has to happen, because there is a 24-7 war against democracy. It is from the top down. It's about people who have wealth and power who don't want to give it up, and we know that. I've been asked today, and I'm very pleased to speak about media and the role of media, because so often it's hidden in plain sight. You know, we've got, and I'm so glad to get a roster, when you look at media, 61, 62, different forms of voter suppression, it's hard to keep up, and what do you get on TV? What do you get on the radio? Spin the dial, use the clicker, and what do you get? You're getting diversion. You're getting misinformation, you're getting disinformation, you're getting infotainment, you're getting what could be called disinfotainment, and it's on and on and on. And as Aldous Huxley said in his introduction to Brave New World, he said, lies are powerful, but even more powerful is silence about truth. And do we get silence? We get it almost 24-7 from our mass media, from our corporate media, from our de facto commercial media called NPR and PBS, right? And what are we getting even from our independent progressive media? We're getting some good stuff, but not enough. And it's the silences that are on the windpipe of the First Amendment choking us off. That's where we are right now in terms of voter suppression. It's being orchestrated through many different layers, many different channels, agendas to not only sit on the windpipe of the First Amendment, but make sure that this pernicious, dangerous idea called democracy isn't activated more fully. Well, two years ago, I worked with colleagues where I am at groupsaction.org, and we issued the first of two annual reports called Autopsy, the Democratic Party in Crisis. And among the sections, you can still see it online at democraticautopsy.org, one of the things that we discovered under our inquiry on voter participation is that the previous May, so this would have been May of 2017, the Democratic National Committee expanded its full-time staffing to work on issues of voter suppression. They expanded their full-time staffing from one person to four people. Wow. Hallelujah. Where were they? Where were they with the millions and millions of dollars being spent on all kinds of stuff? And they got this skeleton staff, and then we're supposed to feel so great when they quadrupled it to four. I don't feel grateful about that. I feel angry about it. And then what happened into this first term that is a result of voter suppression, the first term of the Trump regime? What happened? Well, 
You can't say that the DNC totally inactive on the legal front. The DNC filed a lawsuit against Russia. <laughs> against Russia. Now, I want to ask you to consider these 62 items. How many of them were perpetrated by Vladimir Putin and the Kremlin? <laughs> this is not a coincidence. Now, people say, oh, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can talk about how Russia intervened and talk about our problems here. Now, I work with the Media Watch Group FAIR, Fairness and Accuracy Reporting. I urge you, if you're not already signed up, go to FAIR.org. We've been monitoring media bias and spin for 30 plus years now. And when you look at, as FAIR did, statistically, who's the patron saint? for the mainstream Democratic Party. And I am a Democrat. Believe me, I'm on the State Central Committee. I'm not trashing the Democratic Party across the board by any means. Who's the patron saint? Rachel Maddow. Yeah. And when Fair did a study, they found more than half of the minutes on there were about, on Rachel Maddow's show, Russia, Russia, Russia. Right. Oh, yeah. The last time I checked, the Kremlin didn't enact voter ID law. <laughs> That's not a check. They didn't do gerrymandering. No. They didn't block same day registration or automatic registration. You go down the list. I don't want to take all your time. All the things that the Kremlin didn't do that was done right under our noses, mm -hmm. where it is a domestic contagion. The crime scenes, we know, turn on the news at 5 o'clock. You will see the crime scenes, the car chases, the yellow tape. And as Barbara was pointing out, where is the coverage of what are crime scenes going on every single day in state after state? This is where the media are functionaries for the status quo. The media that encouraged us to divert our attention away from the role of Wall Street, the big money, the voter suppression, the racism, the class bias, the efforts to close down thousands and thousands of polling stations where people of color are, where poor people are, where students are, who would vote the wrong way, exercise the franchise in the wrong way, where was the attention to those issues? Well, turns out we can't walk and chew gum at the same time when there's a finite amount of bandwidth, whether or figuratively, at least symbolically, there's a finite amount of airspace, airtime, and print media. There's only so much space on the front page. News media maybe can't tell us exactly what to think, but they can pretty damn well sure tell us what to think about. And when we think about our democracy being under assault from foreigners, that diverts attention from where the huge problem is where the Koch brothers are. You would think that the United States doesn't have oligarchs. We got oligarchs and they're running our election system. That's how it's structured, that's how it functions. And if we want to solve this problem, it's this organizing is so crucial to identify, to analyze, to share with each other, to keep up with what the news media should be informing us about and are not. We know that democracy has to be the informed consent of the government. The informed consent. If it is uninformed consent, it's not consent at all, it's not democracy at all, it's nonsense. Yeah. A friend of mine, uh, Selena Vickers, who lives in West Virginia, you may have seen her in Mike Moore's latest film, the Eleven Nine film. She uh, worked very hard in the 2016 election, and Bernie Sanders in the primary carried every single county in West Virginia. Wow. And guess what? The West Virginia sent more Hillary Clinton delegates to the National Convention That's than they right. sent Bernie Sanders delegates. Right. Wow. Yep. Because of the existence of super delegates. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. It won't be a 
new quotation to you when I mention, as Frederick Douglass said, that power never conceives without a struggle. And a lot of what we're getting, and I think this is a challenge, as we look at mass media and even a lot of independent, non-corporate media, it's a challenge to discourage us. It's no use. They have all the power. It's rigged. It's rigged hundreds and hundreds of ways from the registration to the way that the parties are run, the way that machines are operating or not operating, the way it's voting, the voting and, and uh, counting takes place. It's no use. I'm sure we've all heard this. Maybe sometimes we, we felt it. Those forces are just too powerful. And sometimes I've heard people on call-in shows say, uh, I'm not going to vote. It doesn't make any difference. They have all the power, which is part of the passive media message to me. Because really, let's face it, what is the most important activity that you are encouraged to do as a listener to radio, as a viewer of television, and increasingly as you're getting into YouTube? It's to go out and buy things. And if you make a list of the priorities of the mass media message, go out and vote is really a lot. Really a lot. Because who's going to make money off of that? So in, the, in, the, in the economic agenda, the warfare that's being waged against democracy, the warfare to maximize profits and minimize paying out with salaries and benefits and health care and so forth, the mass media are a huge tool. So to segue here into the activism aspect here, we're encouraged, at least tacitly, to believe that if we confront a media outlet, somehow we're uh, intruding on the First Amendment. You know, this idea that if you have a right or a capacity to own a TV station, to own a radio station, and now their channel or whatever, only hundreds, then you got it. And who are us? us lowly citizens or non-citizens. What, why should we actually disrupt that? That's their free speech rights. You know, it's sort of like a Citizens United on steroids in the media realm, this, this propaganda concept that uh, your, your free speech is um, amplified uh, properly just by the sense you got, you got big bucks. And so whether we're talking about Channel 2 or Channel 5 in the Bay Area, for the Chronicle or the Oakland Tribune. I think it's important to uh, acknowledge ourselves and recognize that many of the workers there, they're trying to do a good job. They're often overpaid under work. They wish that they had more latitude to do, to do their jobs effectively. And they work for the bosses. Now, I don't know about you, but I am going to assume that the people who put burgers at McDonald's have less to say about what's in the meat than the people who own McDonald's. And the same is true of these media outlets. We do have a oligarchy that largely controls, not all, but most, through ownership and advertising, the basic parameters of what's covered. And so as activists, I think we have a tremendous opportunity to, wherever we live, to go through, you might say, a Gandhian process uh, what was implemented so well during the civil rights movement is you, you do the research, you lay out the problem, you make the case, and you escalate. And if the newspaper, the other media outlet that you're concerned with is not doing an adequate job, then it's our opportunity to provide them and others with the research and um, urge them to make change in their coverage, their, their silences, and what they put in and what they leave out. And if they're not doing their job, then, as is so often the case in so many parameters we, uh, and context, we have the opportunity to put pressure on them. And it can work. It's worked so many times. Um, at rootsaction.org, where uh, I'm part of the, uh, the organizing, we have 1.2 million people now active online in the United States, which actually got we worked for, uh, we started at zero eight years ago, and 
We've worked on many, many issues, as you'll see. If you're not signed up yet, please do at reachaction.org for action alerts. And one of the many, many issues we've worked on is automatic voter registration. We have a map, and we started, and it was just very little. When you have a map of the country a couple of years ago, very few states, and the, the map is filling in. And so we can message people in different states to go to their state legislatures with email and phone calls and their governors and so forth. And let's get this done, right? That's what it's all about, it's getting it done. And we're getting almost no help from the mass media. We have to be our own media, right? Uh, like Nicholas Johnson, one of the only decent uh, FCC commissioners we can really be proud of in the last few decades, he said, you've got a tough factor television set. Now we have a lot of other media outlets and mediums uh, controlled by mostly big money that we can talk back to and about. These issues almost never come from the top down, right? I mean, think of everything we're proud of that has been accomplished in the last 10, 20, 30, 50, 80, 100 years in this country. It's the same on implementing voter democracy, real democracy. It's never handed down. We know that. Sometimes we may forget. News we hear about encouraging us to forget. Encouraging us to believe that, oh, do we elect the right person with a part of the machinations? And this is as true of, of NPR News as it is of any other validly perfectly outlet. If only the right people in power can be uh, shown the error of their ways. No, it's not about showing them the error of their ways. We've done enough talking through. We've done enough. We've done enough talking truth. Two power. Are you okay? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure. Power. Yeah. Power. There we go. We're okay now. Huh? Yeah. Is that you over there? It's just this antenna. Oh, it's the antenna. It's the antenna doing. I can shout really loud, but it probably won't help for the recording. Well, we, we got out the internet. I think we're okay. Go ahead. Okay. Getting some feedback here. Yeah. Um, I was just saying, we've done enough talking, we've done enough speaking truth to power. Power knows what it's doing. Those who are orchestrating voter suppression, they know what they're doing. People on Wall Street, they know what they're doing. It can be helpful to speak truth to power. I'm not against it. You know, Daniel Ellsberg will tell you he was in the Pentagon when people were demonstrating in October 1967 and it had an effect on him. He was looking out the window. So, yes, fine, speak truth to power. But much more important to speak truth about power to each other and organize because instead of looking up at the powerful, we look to each other. And that really, that's what it's all about. All right, if you can uh, line up with the mic there. Seven minutes, we've got another two, three questions over here. I just want to articulate the obvious. I always ask, why don't the Democrats pick up the cudgels? And you answer it. The answer is they're more afraid of their donors than they are of losing the Republicans. They're more afraid of losing their corporate donors than they are of losing their public. Uh, this way they can show. Yeah. Um, I would say there are many Democratic parties, in a sense, in the context. I feel like we're going into a twilight zone. Uh, I would say there, there are many Democratic parties. In this question, there are uh, tremendous uh, activists, uh, inside the party, fighting like hell. The reason we got rid of the superdelegates in the first ballot was because of the sort that took place. Uh, so what I would say, there are a lot of voices in the Democratic Party at the top that would just assume the Republicans stay in the White House that they, big donors, Wall Street, etc to lose control of the Democratic Party. They just don't want to lose it. Trump was a high price to pay for getting rid of Hillary. Uh, I, I think, well, that's a whole other question. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
I actually think he made a lot of people pay attention uh, that bad. So a lot of people who weren't involved are getting involved. My question to you is I feel like I've signed, I don't know how many petitions and written and so when you say that it actually does help, you know you're sending letters and emails to the government. I don't know. I don't know that I feel that it's making a difference. I haven't seen it, though. I've written, and I've done all those things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there are uh, examples where we made progress only because people have done such things. We know it's discouraging, it's tedious, getting back to the media messaging. Media messaging is uh, explicitly or implicitly don't really bother, nothing much for a change. Uh, that's a, a narrative that I think we need to counter. I would take the point as well. I would take the point as well that um, we need to find more creative ways to content what we're doing. Uh, so, uh, there's no wire to current suppression. There's no silver bullet. Uh, and creativity will be crucial because it's not you know doing this, that, or the other. We need the. Uh, a garden that is very diverse in how we approach right, tactical. Because you said that it did apply pressure, and I, I was just wondering, you know, what results? How did you know that kind of thing? Well, the delegation is a great example. I mean, Roots Action, uh, where I am, worked with our revolution, Progressive Democrats of America, other groups to say this super delegates is outrageous. And uh, there were a lot of tedious hearings. We helped to uh, politely disrupt one of them in Washington, D.C. a couple of years ago. And it was because of that organizing that we don't right now have across the bottom of the cable news networks every day a crawl that says that Joe Biden has a hundred and some delegates already. Because that's what happened four years ago. Before there was a single vote cast in a caucus or a primary, Hillary Clinton had a couple of hundred superdelegate votes that were already being quote unquote calibrated and Bernie had like four. So it's because people organized that we're not having to deal with that particular problem now. All right, thank you. Thank you. Last question. So, can you hear me? There's a pretty good best practice at this point, at least the more people I know about how to reach politicians to the kind of ask particularly how to approach them. I mean, most of the scripts I've seen over the past few years have gotten typed. They say, hi, I like you for this reason. And basically, they give them just what they need to hear. You can't, well, I'm starting to wonder how you reach each other. Yes. You don't want to ask the same things. How do you work for it? Journalists don't. What incentives, how do you approach journalists to say, hi, what issue you're really curious about and you love your help they need to do it? What's the right framework? for getting a journalist to go, oh, okay, wait, you know what, this is interesting, and my audience wants to Yeah, great. Uh, I'd answer that in terms of two avenues. One is that we've got to be polite and insistent at the same time, persistent, emails, phone calls, letters, showing up at the office, being very clear and going up the chain of command if necessary to uh, insist that these crucial issues be dealt with consistently and in a deep and thorough manner. Also, you know, there's a saying, is it Scoop Nisker who said long ago, if you don't like the news, make some of your own. And in that sense, in that sense, we've got a um, challenge to change the political terrain so that news media will respond to it. And I'll give you a quick example. Unless we are able to challenge incumbents in primaries, then in a political sense, the political journalists will rarely take us very seriously. If we were nice and refused to primary people who weren't as bad as Republicans, then Joe Crowley, Joe Crowley would still be the fourth most powerful Democrat um, in the House of Representatives instead of out lobbying, and he'd be sitting where Alexandria Casa Cortez is. So it's about, again, organizing.
microphone, please. Yeah, please. Well, you can't hear. It's for the recording. Sorry, I just think that's an important point to make because it's a good question about how to get people's attention. And the news works on a, a topical basis. So if you're trying to get something, an issue that you care about in the news, it's really important to go through that news organization's articles and connect your comment to something they're already covering, something topical, something that just happened. That's how the news works. So you just gotta connect into what they're doing specifically at that news outlet and something that happened recently, and that's a good way to get your, your topic in there. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.